Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to our 2023 Cybersecurity Predictions webcast. My name is Devin Gillard. I'm your host. I'm the CMO at F12.net. And uh, to help us with this conversation, I'm joined today by my two favorite cybersecurity nerds. If you don't mind me calling you that, um, we've got Corey Nockreiner. He's the CSO, Chief Security Officer of WatchGuard, joining us from Seattle, if I understand correctly, All right, Corey? Yeah, excellent. That is correct. And we've got, yeah, we've got the Chief Technology Officer of F12.net, Calvin Engen, joining us from Edmonton. Welcome, gentlemen. All right, so uh, a few notes for our audience, those who are joining live. I know uh, a lot of folks catch this afterward in recordings and through our newsletter. If you happen to be live, we've got two great experts here. Really fortunate to have your attention and time today. If you, uh, if our, if anybody attending has any questions throughout the course of this conversation, there's a Q&A on the right-hand side of this AirMeet platform. Go ahead and put them in. We'll get to all the questions that we can. Um, you know, I can, I can say, and you'll see it throughout the course of this conversation, um, there's an immense amount of knowledge uh, in, in these two brains. And I'm going to do my best to get it out. But you can all help by, uh, you know, by sending in some questions, and we'll continue this conversation as we go. Um, so the general topic we have is about what we see coming, what we can anticipate in cyber and the whole cybersecurity landscape, the threats, the nation state actors, what's going to happen in 2023, and then how we can translate that for our audience, for their businesses, their organizations. What does it mean in practical terms? So we're, we're going to have a pretty freewheeling conversation about that. But let's first of all start by who's who in the zoo. Um, Corey, you're the CSO now of WatchGuard. Let's start out with what is WatchGuard? Let sure, us know. sure. If folks haven't heard of WatchGuard, WatchGuard basically is a company that provides cybersecurity to mid-market companies. Uh, and we do it through fantastic channel partners and managed service providers like F12. So uh, we deliver enterprise grade security to that mid-market. So what that means is the mid-market includes even the smallest businesses. So we can translate really complex security into products, unified security products that uh, a smaller company can use, especially if they go with a managed service provider. In providing security seems generic. We say that because we now uh, provide full stack security. So what I mean by that is our products include network security products, endpoint security products, and authentication or identity security products. So to me, really the three pillars of different types of security. We're best known for our Firebox, which is a network security product. You know, analysts would call it a unified threat management system or a next so for generation all, firewall. All of our guests, Corey, yeah. sorry to talk over you. For for any F12 client that's joining us, that's the red box in your server room or wiring closet or whatever. It's WatchGuard. Yeah, yeah. So red, red is definitely our color. We figure the Firebox, the color should define itself. But that has gone well beyond, you know, I hate when people used to call us a firewall company because even our yeah. next generation firewall now has like 10 plus security services, all network focused services like intrusion prevention, many types of anti malware, data loss prevention, anti spam. So think of it as full suite network security in one either physical or virtual and cloud firebox. Uh, on the endpoint side of things, you know, about uh, almost two years ago, I know, now I guess the time is going fast, we acquired an endpoint security company called Panda Security. And that gives us both EPP, which stands for endpoint protection, and EDR, which is endpoint detection and response. And combined, it's like a full anti malware solution. You know, EPP preventively blocks the malware that the industry knows, whereas EDR catches the more sophisticated malware that sometimes gets past that pre-execution detection. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, uh, on the identity or authentication side, side of things, we have AuthPoint, <coughs> which, my goodness, is full suite <laughs> uh, multi-factor authentication. So everything from logging onto your desktop every morning yeah to going to any SaaS application, we provide a multi-factor authentication solution, which is great for small business because it's now, you know, hardware and serverless. It's all supported by cloud. It's a cloud-based service and just mobile devices. It uses mobile push authentication and other things uh, for MFA. So really a full suite of security products designed for the mid-market. It, it's probably um, 
the case that most of our clients have heard of WatchGuard for all of the reasons you just mentioned, but we, ha we have a pretty wide audience. So thanks, Corey, for taking us through that. Yeah, and this is just conversational style. So take a, take a water if, uh, <laughs> you know, if you've got a frog in your throat. Um, so, so, so we've talked about WatchGuard. You've been with WatchGuard for quite some time, Corey. Oh my goodness, over, I, I'm like a anomaly in the tech industry where people move jobs every four to five years. I've been here over 20 years. I started, believe it or not, in first level support. Uh, I was the CTO, I've been an executive for over seven years now, was chief technology officer, which was not head of engineering, more kind of the security guru and in, in kind of security strategy guy doing biz dev. A lot of the acquisitions, I worked with an executive team to, to execute those. But, but now, you know, we think it's as definitely as a security company, and we'll talk about probably supply chain is a trend, Perfect. you know, uh, it, it's... I'm taking on the role of securing my own company based on the expertise I've developed over the last few decades. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're a very busy executive, so I appreciate it. Um, go over to Calvin. He's our CTO, CISSP. He's responsible for the security, not just as you like to say, Calvin, of F12 and all of our clients. You view that as your entire portfolio and responsibility. Um, so thank you for joining us. Before we move on to predictions, it might just be helpful for the audience to know a little bit about our history and relationship with WatchGuard um, from an F12 lens. And because uh, I know it goes back a long time. And as yeah. the curator of our security solutions and vendors, you know, why do we work with uh, WatchGuard? Just pretend Corey's not here, you know, give us, <laughs> sure. give us the straight goods. Yeah. Yeah. Here it comes. Earmuffs. Earmuffs. <laughs> so, um, so for some that don't know, I've been with uh, F12 for 16, just over 16 years, um, and we've been partnered with WatchGuard for uh, over 14 years. We uh, we started the relationship back in 2008, actually 2007. So, um, and and the reason why was is that we were we were looking at the time for a really great firewall vendor, and um, that's where the relationship. started started they didn't have identity management that wasn't a thing they didn't have endpoint security just yet um and over time as uh watchguard matured their uh, their stack we've integrated additional products and made that part of our uh, our suite of offering to our clients um and so that being said we evaluate our vendors every year and we we validate against what you know what is the you know the right technology and services that we're delivering to our clients. And so um, WatchGuard has uh, been able to rise to the occasion time and time again, um, which is a hard, hard thing to do because we have swapped many vendors over the over the last uh, decade and a half since I've been working on the technology side. And so um, that being said, it hasn't been always roses. Um, I know uh, we've had some challenges, but uh, what, what I can commend the WatchGuard team is that they've always come up with a, a way to uh, to make things right and improve the product, whether that's increasing security, whether that is um, making it more uh, efficient from a uh, from a technology standpoint. And so uh, we've had a uh, a long term partnership, and as a result, we've been able to uh, influence uh, some of the uh, uh, the decision making and uh, things that we believe our clients really think are important from a security perspective, and have that uh, you know made known and uh, built into the product. But I just want to underscore that a little bit because I think you're underselling it. I've often said, this is a little secret here at Corey at, at F12, I would never want to sell something to Calvin because he <laughs> holds people to account. He's a grinder. He's, you know, like the, 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 and I say this in the context of the duration of our relationship is a testament to, um, how much faith and trust we've had in WatchGuard over the years, and uh, we value that relationship. But let's move along now. We've uh, right. we, we've started I, to I, do the good say stuff. real quick, Devin. Yeah. I, I appreciate the Calvins and Grinders. You know, we are a security focused company, and uh, I, I like to say we champagne our own products for our security. I'm the CISO guy, but another term is dog fooding. So, <laughs> like Calvin, if yeah. if things aren't performing the way I need them to as the CSO, I will grind on our product managers too. But I think the beauty is we we appreciate that. You know, you can make a great product if you listen to your customers tell you what's good and bad and do something about it. That's how you create an amazing product. So appreciate people that give us honest feedback and are willing to work with us to make things better. So I we think should all be thankful for our tough customers. Hey, like that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And you know, and security of all things is it's a, it's such an evolving, ever evolving 
um, landscape. And, you know, we, we, we're all running as fast as we can to keep ahead of an, what is now a massive industry that's running really fast to try to defeat our, um, our protections, our measures, our controls and policies, which is a great segue to what we want to talk about, which is predictions. So the reason why we invited Corey, not just because uh, he's a great friend of F12 and uh, has you know, a great global perspective on the cybersecurity landscape, but the timing is right because WatchGuard issues annual headline grabbing cybersecurity predictions. It's on their website that, uh, and we're gonna get a sneak peek into those cybersecurity predictions. Um, you can find them by going to WatchGuard, uh, just Googling WatchGuard and predictions. I'll put a link a little bit later in the chat so everybody has it in case you're having trouble finding it. But I thought for fun, before we delve into 2023, Corey, let's look at 2022. So I'm just going to bring up the uh, the what's live on the website right now so everybody knows where to go and uh, can see it. So hopefully this works well. The WatchGuard's 2022 predictions. Um, if you go to WatchGuard predictions, just so everybody knows, in December, uh, and Corey, you can let us know about, about the time you're aiming, there will be the 2023 predictions. Yes, exactly. It, it is really the early December, I believe. It could We could make it right at the end of November, but we're about to film uh, the videos we put up with them yeah. uh, right after Thanksgiving. So expect them uh, no later than the first few weeks of December. So I but encourage... I love oh, go ahead, Calvin. Uh, I was going to say, what I love about this is that, uh, you know, there's not very many uh, companies that uh, not only put out predictions, but then also keep the history. Yeah. 2019, 2020, 21. Yeah. And, so and by the we, way, if I can uh, sh do, oh, finish, Calvin, finish. Sorry. No, I was just, I was just going to say, and, uh, and so like, you know, you can use like the, the way back machine to figure out, you know, what was said, but uh, I love it. You make it very easy for everyone to see uh, how, uh, how right you were, or maybe how wrong you were in some cases. <laughs> to, to add to that, by the way, and if Devin doesn't mind me marketing my own podcast, if you go to sec secplicity.org, uh, secplicity.org is our thought leadership uh, uh, blog, and there we have the 443 uh, podcast, which is our weekly security podcast. And the last episode was literally our prediction recap episode. So we, oh, grade, our, we grade ourselves on our predictions. Uh, we've been as high as 80% correct. I, I'll, without killing the entire prod, uh, podcast, I will say we got a passing grade, but it was not one mom would be proud of because it was in the, the low 60s. So this, this year, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a few of them you'll probably ask me about. But we, yeah. we, we, we were only in the 60s this year for accuracy, according to our own very detailed grading scale of win, <laughs> meh, or fail. That's how we Love grade it. ourselves. Love it. Win Love is it. a point, fail is a fail, and meh, we give ourselves half a point. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> at least there's a methodology behind your, your scoring. It's great that you look back in it. Yeah. So as Calvin mentioned, you can go back here and see previous ones. There's videos about each of the predictions. So, um, and I say this because the 2023 ones are coming out, but it's, it's actually was a fun watch to go through 2022. I want to talk about a little about these. One thing um, that's we're seeing that I thought, you know, in my opinion, Corey, it was nail on the head, and I'm sure you did as well when you look back on it, was companies increase cyber insurance despite soaring costs. Both the soaring costs and the increasing. I, I From our client base, that was spot on. Tell us a little bit about that prediction. Yeah, we, we considered that one. We did grade ourselves a full win for that one. And that is basically the, the trend of rising costs. I think anyone who's had to renew their cybersecurity insurance in the past year has seen this happen. You know, I kind of blame the insurers. If you go back about four years in predictions, we had a prediction that ransomware authors would target insurers because insurers' yeah. primary strategy for dealing with it was actually paying ransoms. You know, a lot of the customers they insured back four years ago, they weren't validating security controls of those customers. They didn't know really how secure those customers they were insuring were. And they decided to pay the ransom every time, you know, a customer didn't have backups. So they're not only kind of uh, approving bad security practices of their clients, 
but they were also approving a malicious business model and proving ransomware authors could make money. As a result, you know, their lack of long-term actuary tables on whether or not paying ransom worked, they lost money. Their costs have, insurance costs have risen and they lost a lot of money to cybersecurity insurance, which is why they turned all that around. They turned it around by raising costs for customers, uh, but also more importantly, in some ways, raising compliance standards. Now they do check their client security in depth with actual active scans and long questionnaires and threaten not to insure you if you have some some strike. We've noticed those long yep. questionnaires end up <laughs> passed over to F12. So Calvin, easy low ball question for you. Are we paying more for our cybersecurity despite all yeah, of our Yeah, we definitely are. Um, yeah. You know, in fact, I was on a, uh, a webinar just not too long ago with the Insurance Bureau of Canada. And in 2021 alone, it was four times the amount of premium that they brought in was the payout that they were consuming, 4X, which is why absolutely what you're seeing, Corey, is that uh, it's harder to get insurance. Um, the premiums are higher and I'm finding that the coverage are coming down. So you're getting less for the value of money. And so you put all that up, the reality is businesses having to take on more risk themselves in order to, uh, to you know, take on some of these uh, attack vectors that we're seeing. And so. I, I would like to uh, invite the audience. We're, we're going to bring an industry expert on the insurance industry who specializes in technology and cyber insurance. Is going to give us an insider perspective at our next uh, webcast. You'll see it in your inbox already, the invite. We can perhaps, uh, Qtessa can put up a, a little note or we can uh, promote that. So we're going to dive into the challenges behind the industry. It, we, I think we're calling it, uh, all I want for Christmas is cybersecurity, but the Grinch stole my coverage. That's our humor. <laughs> title for it. it's gonna be a great conversation i learned a bunch just i thought i knew about cyber insurance i learned a bunch just in the prep call so i encourage everybody to join that so we gave you one that was a plus but i kind of want to go on one Corey, that i think i was like what um news of hackers targeting space hits the headlines i'm a space guy i didn't hear about this we gave ourselves a win. You might not be okay, following Okay, then I, I thought there might be something here. Tell me. Yeah, tell. yeah. There, there are some fails if you want to talk about those later, too. I'll, I will give away the ones that we didn't okay. think we hit. But we thought we hit this one uh, because of two things. I, I guess you didn't have, uh, I mean, actually, there were significant headlines. So the first thing, one is more a nerdy thing that not everyone would catch. Uh, there was a, a black hat. There was a talk by a gray hat researcher at the Black Hat and DEF CON security conferences this year on hacking a Starlink. So just real quick, the prediction is hackers would target space. And if you read the details, we were mostly talking about satellite technology. One, a lot of satellite technology is old and normal people may not realize that simple radio gear can get you communicating with satellites. It used to be overly expensive to get the right antennas and gear to talk to them. But now for about $300 of gear, you too can actually start communicating with satellites. So one is old technology from older satellites. But the bigger thing is the fact that satellites have been commercialized. You probably know Musk Starlink, you know, offering satellite-based internet. I think he's well over 5,000 satellites up there and has plans to get up to 20,000 in the next few years. So it was really based on a lot of consumer grade equipment going into space that has network connectivity that's basically radio based. Granted, Starlinks probably have better security than the original government satellites. So why is this a win? Again, that Black Hat researcher, they actually hacked a Starlink base station. Fascinating. I did not know this. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So the researcher was able because when you buy Starlink, you, you get a base station that communicates yeah. with satellites. It had deep security. It had a kind of hardened firmware. And you could see, uh, you know, normally you wouldn't be able to see any of the traffic it was sending. It's all encrypted. But he found a way to basically route the Starlink device with a mod chip. And after doing that, they are, he's able to capture all the clear text traffic that's being sent back and forth to the satellites that Starlink uses. Now, the good news here is he didn't find any vulnerability beyond that. But his, his premise is by being able to see that, that traffic, he now can actually target the satellites themselves. So when that you was- you say targeting though, that, that just, I know um, Starlink and its deployment in Ukraine has been uh, a huge advantage. Pivotal. 
pivotal yeah, for the though. Ukrainian effort and their ability to ma manage logistics and information. I'm sure yeah. Russia took note of this, right? The, you just got to oh, think of sure. the ramifications. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of Ukraine, that is the one that really pushed us into the wind territory. This we could see how you would maybe call it a researcher based meh. But remember, you might not remember, but satellites were targeted specifically in the Ukraine war. Russia was able to take down Viasat for a few days. And that's in part why Starlink were starting wow. to be used. So Viasat is, of course, a well-known satellite company. And there's early in the Ukraine, you know, uh, aggression. There was a period of time. Now, interestingly, we talked about the hack being in space. We forget that satellites are two-way communication. Sure. And the way they, they were able. Ground. Yeah. Exactly. So it was actually the ground station, uh, you know, dishes that they were able to use a cyber attack to disrupt. But the effect was still taking down the satellite network. So for a period of time. So that particular Viasat Ukraine thing is the one that really pushed us over the edge to say that we actually hit this. Okay. Part. I give up. I tried to school you and you just schooled me. You just totally. Uh, so I'm going to throw it to Calvin. Calvin, any prediction you'd like to have a conversation with Corey about? Oh, goodness. Um, one, also just to tag onto the space is that uh, um, SpaceX with the Falcon 9 also used to have their uh, video feed unencrypted. Uh, and just oh, recently, their telemetry was unencrypted. So you oh, could wow. actually pull that information down and uh, get a, a real-time feed. Um, they've since fixed those issues, but uh, nonetheless, it's uh, the consumerization of, um, of space. We're going to see a lot a lot of more exactly. of these types of things happening. So, and if you um, wanted to physically target equipment with missiles and stuff, I'm sure that telemetry would be very useful data to a threat actor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, one of the things I'd love to dive into is just around uh, supply chain. And, um, you know, just the and not like the wider uh, supply chain, but when I think about the supply chain related to the small to medium businesses that exist out there, you know, many organizations lean into third parties to be able to provide uh, services um, that might be um, software as a service vendors that could be, you know, a managed service provider, a managed security provider like F12. And so I'd love to hear your predictions around, um, you know, what you're going to see around uh, this topic, because I think it is an absolute challenge that we're seeing in the industry. And a lot of people don't know where to start or what to ask. And so love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure, sure. And this is getting to the 2023 predictions, by the way, where I can give you a hint of one of the predictions. First, I agree with you. The, the way I talk about this is what I call the digital supply chain. So a lot of people hear a supply chain and they think, you know, physical manufacturing and shipping of, of, of stuff. Uh, when I'm talking about supply chain, I'm talking about every business that uses tech. None of us do it alone. All of us are reliant on third party vendors that, as you say, supply software and hardware to us. And we have to we put this software in a trusted position inside our network. So it's not just stuff that is the same as untrusted internet it's stuff we're putting in positions where they have higher privilege and we often give the this software and the, this hardware specifically higher privilege so that it can do its analysis and there's by the way even a service supply chain where we work with partners it it can be non-technical partners like hvac vendors who you might remember the target breach way back when or it could be digital partners where we're using services and third party SaaS, you know, software as a service cloud products. So that is kind of the digital supply chain Calvin and I are talking about. And going into trends, not even talking predictions, I think a lot of you have probably seen supply chain hacks. Uh, SolarWinds. SolarWinds, a well-known company, yeah. creates a product called Orion that a lot of IT departments use to monitor their network architecture and solar winds had a enterprise breach where threat actors breached their actual company gained access to their full software life cycle you know packaging and deployment servers and were able to take their official installer of this product and put a trojan in it so you know a customer that's just downloading the latest version of solar winds orion from the perfectly legitimate vendor got got a a booby trapped you know uh, uh, installer. 
So that is a supply chain hack. You know, uh, you could also, this is maybe a softer supply chain hack, but another way you could think about it is just a vulnerability in a product. Sure. Maybe the com company in question that provides the product didn't get hacked, but if some bad guy finds a really critical zero day, so unpatched vulnerability in their product, if you're using that product, it can be an avenue for them to get into your company. So the issue with these supply chain hacks is, even if you're a more mature at cybersecurity, you've done a good job of securing yourself, you've also let partners have elevated privilege. And if they're not equally good at securing their stuff, they become kind of a less controlled avenue into your own company. So that is the, the supply chain problem. I want to get to your prediction, though, because it sounds like you've got some ideas of what, what's going to happen here in 2023. Yeah, the prediction is essentially, you know, when you're looking at services and products, usually you care about price performance as a, a buying factor. We think in 2023, cybersecurity evaluation of the vendor is going to become one of the top factors, maybe not number one, but potentially the number two factor in selecting vendors. You're going to want to know if that vendor or service provider does good security themselves. And there's a whole industry of products coming around this, like uh, OneTrust, you know, one of the things companies already have to do is deal with privacy regulation. And a lot of the products that help you uh, manage your customer privacy are also starting to build in vendor validation capabilities. Yeah. Pre-made questionnaires that you as a customer can send a partner and say, tell me about your security. Or things like checking for certification. Are you ISO 2701 certified? Because if not, I'm going to have to send you a really long questionnaire because I don't know if you're doing the basics to secure your cloud. Or are you SOC 2 or SOC 1 certified? So our prediction is this is going to become a, you know, honestly, I don't think a lot of companies thought too much about the security, the cybersecurity of the vendor they're buying from. They were more concerned about the features meeting their business need, the price, and things like that. But in 2023, vendor validation, these long questionnaires that customers are going to be sending people to figure out if you're doing the right thing security-wise will become the norm and part of the buying decision. So, Calvin, I'd love to get your reaction because I saw you kind of cheer about that. Uh, I'm not surprised by your reaction, but share a little bit of your thoughts about vendor validation and cybersecurity in 2023. I feel like I've influenced this with Corey because ah. he actually <laughs> did our vendor risk review himself. And so uh, there's a number of questions that he was answering on uh, on our, our vendor risk profile. So, you know, I, I, I think this is one of those elements where um, it's a valid, it's like trust, but verify. And, um, and so, you know, what, what Corey's really saying is, is, if you buy a product, any product that may look like, whether it's security or, or otherwise, is have you validated that whatever the thing that you're buying is safe and secure? And is the organization behind that product something that's safe and secure? Because often we're not finding that it's the front end of the product that's getting breached. It's actually the back end. It's the developers. It's the um, it's you know some sort of back door that's been created that often is a threat um vector that is then compromised and that's how they get in and so the challenge becomes is if they don't have great policies and procedures in place and you validated that you won't know um but it might change your decision on purchasing that product if you did know and yeah. so it's about understanding what that is and and we do this um continuously any vendor that comes in any vendor that we use internally for f12 or for our clients um, we go through a, a very uh, rigorous uh, pr profile to understand how how adept are these uh, these products and services. And so uh, I just love that the fact that this is getting more traction and we're hearing more about it in the market. Absolutely. And I, I, and I will probably, say, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Dan. I was going to say, I can, I can uh, attest to that in two ways. Number one, you know, even marketing, if we want to bring on a product or service, maybe help us manage our contracts. Calvin's team goes through really, you know, it's going to have client information. Let's go through our validation. It's rigorous. The second thing about Corey that's an early indicator that we're seeing in, in our conversation with clients is the intelligence of the mid-market and upper SMB market and asking ask security questions in the last year is, is I just yesterday I was in a meeting 
surrounded by some of the most intelligent individuals in this company who had very specific knowledge about controls and regulations and cybersecurity measures. It was it was so energetic to be in a room where the, the client is so well educated on these and and scrutinizing us. It, it was it was absolutely terrific. I, I did cut you off there, Corey. Oh, no, no, I, I, I agree that I, I love to see the end users security uh, awareness and, and intelligence go up. I, 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 I think the past five years, people have been bit enough where they had they, they can't ignore it and they have to become aware. So, yeah, just agreeing with Calvin, I'll, I'll give him partial credit for finishing his. But to be honest, uh, we've had a ton of customers and partners over the past three years start to we've seen an increase. And like you guys, we have our own policy because. Uh, if you're an organization, SaaS, cloud-based products make it so easy for, yeah. Devin used the example of marketing, to just go pick some vendor on their own, buy it without even going through IT. It's $5 or, or a month security. or something, so people think nothing of it, right? Ah, uh, what's the deal? Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. to be honest, you're doing something cool and innovative to do your job, which is a good thing. But you may not be thinking that, oh, yeah, to do this service, I have to upload all these market. It is this marketing spreadsheet that has a lot of PII in it so that they can do their or analytics. You're putting a plugin into your Outlook, which is just great, and you know, all this stuff. Yeah, uh, exactly. And the one yeah. And the one thing I would say is like um, understanding it because, you know, five dollars, I can tell you most customers like vendors of that stature um, aren't going to have the Absolutely. necessary controls. And so what you put into the platform, you might still use it, but you might yeah. think twice of what have data you analysis. actually put in it. Exactly. exactly. I agree. So it's it's not that we want to, as a CSO organization or CIS organization, disrupt that because that's kind of innovative and cool for you to be able to go and select services. But we want to be as soon as you're thinking about it, we the, we have triggers basically on purchase orders that starts our vendor validation. And we just want to be part of that conversation. So just like Calvin said, you have to now talk to him when selecting vendors. Yeah. We, we have a policy and procedure to trigger when departments want to buy some service just to give us a chance to figure out what kind of data they're going to share. And based on that, we can do a risk assessment of the company and a, a validation. So, yeah, I think everyone's going to be doing this now. It's just it's fair to say, too, that yeah. um, one's driving other. Your prediction last year about cybersecurity insurance is yep. driving, driving you know, just this. to qualify. We, we used to try to help our clients get better rates by having and now the cyber they just laugh at you is whether you can qualify or not we're not even making money on this yet so it's we're not we're not in a position they told us to offer a deal yet it's where it's at um so that's a great one we'll, we'll note that one um and i and i think that'll bear out um anything that didn't come true in 2022 that you're you, have you dusted off anything you say no it will sure. be in 2023 that you think might carry forward or has influenced your predictions I, I will say a lot of the time, even in past years, when we do fail, it's only that year. We pick it's predictions, early. as you'll find. Yeah, yeah. we pr pick predictions that get a little dystopian. So it's not that they're not true. They just may not hit till later. But one that failed is we, we mentioned that state-sponsored mobile threats would trickle down to the cybercrime underworld. And, and what we mean by that, to go really quickly, everyone remembers Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a very sophisticated piece of malware made by a nation state, probably a combination of Israel and Israel the United US. States, to be yeah. quite honest, even though no one's perfectly admitted that, that disrupted a uranium enrichment in Iran. It wasn't supposed to leak to the whole world, but it did, and it contained four very interesting zero day. The second it leaked, Cybercrime and criminal malware got better because they used that zero day right away. Cyber yeah. criminals may not be the smartest technicians that figure out the new latest attack, but they're opportunistic. If something that a nation state makes leaks, darn, they will use it and they will up their game. So this was the peanut butter and chocolate where we haven't seen, we know that mobile platforms are a huge threat. Our life are on phones. The good For news sure. is one of the most secure OSs in the world. They have a secure boot thing that's hardware certificate based. So more challenging to get bad software on phones in general. But you might have seen it was the NSO group. There's these actual quote unquote legitimate businesses in Israel that basically they find zero day and flaws in phones and then create spyware specifically for phones that they say they only sell to good guy governments but they're actually making spyware for governments. The prediction was- How is that for a job, hey? 
Wow. I know. It's I don't like I personally don't like the ethics of it because I'm more you should find and fix these flaws than you should find and exploit them. Even as a demo, I, I know that uh, we all need intelligent services and we need red team capability to fight off bad guys. But when it comes to civilian software, we should be protecting, not exploiting, in my opinion. But that's just Corey's opinion. Anyways, our, our point was Pegasus. If you look up Pegasus, it's a well-known one the NSA group sold to governments. We figured that would trickle down now that it's out and cyber criminals would kind of up their game in mobile threats. And while mobile threats exist, we really didn't see any proof of a nation state level uh, mobile malware getting in their hands. So that was a fail. But I do Are you re-upping that. that for 2023, Corey? Are you thinking, was it just early or, or you're not brave I, enough to... I place? may not say next year, but I do think it's just okay. early. I, I do okay. think mobile phones will become an increasing threat factor. It's harder and harder to find vulnerabilities in them, and they're now paying like a really? million, million yeah. dollars for remote routes, which is why it's mostly nation states that are getting their hands on them. But nation states can never perfect anything. They always end up leaking their malware one way or another. So I do think one day criminals would get a nice little nugget from a nation state. Just like remember when the CIA had all their tools stolen and then we got Eternal Blue, which turned WannaCry, the ransomware, into a worm. That was all yeah. because a nation state weaponized and hidden vulnerability leaked to the world. Uh, you know, I get comfort from the fact that government can't keep a secret. It's how I, how I feel. I know that there aren't really aliens in Roswell, New Mexico. I just that, just yeah. You know, anyway, uh, Calvin, uh, <laughs> on your thoughts about mobile and all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm gonna uh, before we go back to Corey. Do you have any thoughts about what you see evolving in 2023? Yeah. So, uh, you know, certainly you know having these kind of mechanisms that we have like secure boot and things like that it, it's actually passing that down through other vendors because while, while that's a, a you know a tremendous attack surface across uh you know many consumers Billions. um there is there's a lot of other devices that exist out there that are not mobile devices or don't have that that sophistication in and it's not, not clear <laughs> yeah it's not clear actually who has that it's not something that's like a certificate, a designation. Um, and so there's many products that exist out there that don't have that functionality. And so this is part of a, you know, a hardware vendor review and, and knowing, you know, what to trust, what to buy. Um, but I think, you know, where I was going was actually IOT is there's a lot of techno um, technology devices that make our lives easier. Um, you know, turning your lights on and off and, and things like that. But the reality is a lot of those devices are, designed for this consumer market and are not putting security front of mind. And so they become uh, a tremendous attack vector. And we see, you know, um, botnets being taken advantage of those things where you can put a little bit of code and they can now do nefarious acts on the internet. And so this is the thing that we got to be uh, more cautious of um, when we're looking so I wanna, at selecting devices. I want to dumb this down a little bit because um, there's sure. terms you use, but I'm just thinking about, you know, your average business so you got a network and you got and you want life to be a little bit better so you bring your google or your sonos to work so you can listen to music maybe you put a, a nest thermostat in because that's fun put a little webcam on because it's cheaper to just buy a consumer webcam it'll record you put it in your office and 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 this you know you got fish sensors like temperature sensors in your aquarium and it just in it it's at it's just can, add, can add, i add, add, add by there's, the way there's, there's, a, there's a, oh sorry I was going oh, to say, no. there's, a, there's a lot of business IoT that has consumer security that we don't. I, I mean, a printer uh, is IoT. Printers sure. have CPUs and hard drives, and they have been taken over and used as a computer. So every company has printers. They're IoT. They Some have secure boot because they're big and good. Some don't. Your TV screens. Every screen in the office now is a smart TV and probably has so an true. Android attached to it. Your conference yeah. room, you know, that polyphony yeah. or whatever special speaker you have in your conference room, that's network internet connected IoT. Your water, you know, a, a company that will remain undisclosed got this very cool bevy water machine, which could do flavored water. You press buttons, some could give, give you seltzer. Guess what? Its thing was an Android pad. It connected to the internet through your local network. It was IoT, that water machine in your network. 
So businesses, a lot of times people think, oh, it's consumer item. Businesses have oh, yeah. IoT. It's, it's not just people bringing in things from home. Good businesses point. have business-specific IoT where price-wise, they're acting just like consumers. So I agree yeah. with Cal. So to me, IoT security, because hardware manufacturers are now getting into a computing and software thing where they're, they're unfamiliar, it's circa 2000 security. You know, they're like Windows back in 2000, which Microsoft's great now, but bad, they were sucky back in 2000. Yeah. So think think of the security practice from 2000 being applied to all those $50 devices on Amazon. Uh, and this is that simple as the office. And this is as simple as we had a we had a piece of technology that um, um, was a camera. It was an interesting camera in that it, it did some infrared and it would actually uh, judge the temperature of a person based off of, um, of the sensors. And so this was during COVID. And so you could determine if Perfect. someone had a fever or not and say, hey, yeah. maybe you shouldn't be in the office. Um, that device was relatively cheap. But guess what it was doing? This, this device was manufactured overseas and it Data was beaconing. calling home. Yeah, yeah. It was beaconing back to uh, an IP in China. So how a nation so, state's doing on its cyber, its, its policies on the virus? Fascinating. Yeah. And There's so, solar panels that do the same, that have VPNs. Not only do they beacon back to China, but they've started to specifically add encryption so local consumers can't see what they're beaconing back either. <laughs> And so, you know, this is all this is all the things that are happening and you wouldn't know you plug it in. You're like, oh, it does what it needs to do. And off I go. Um, and so this is, again, the validation of, of what what is the device and is it a reputable vendor, et cetera, et cetera. So, 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 so let me play devil's advocate, gentlemen, uh, before we leave the IoT side. So I got an IoT and I, I bought one of these things. Why do I care? It's in my office. So somebody hacks my I don't know, my my water cooler flavored water, cooler, bevy, whatever thing that you were talking about, Corey. Um, yeah. Should I care as a business owner? Absolutely, because one day that's going to be your solar winds breach that gets someone to your source code. Everyone's like, oh, a smart fridge? Who gives a crap? What attacker would go your, after your smart fridge? Oh, they'll spoil your food. Scary. I don't give a crap about the smart fridge. What I care about is a bastion host on your internal network. A smart fridge is a Linux computer. Now I have a Linux computer inside your network, not outside. It's past all your security controls. What better way for me to do lateral movement? When your forensic team is trying to figure out where the hacker is coming from, you think they're going to consider the bevy machine or the refrigerator? It's a perfect, that Linux host on your internal network is a perfect place for me to continue to attack your internal network, bypassing all your security. So every device that's within your internal network matters, which, by the way, is the number one tip for this is you should be segmenting your network. Your IoT should not be sitting on the same network as all your normal trusted computers. Yes, your trusted computers, you'll have to punch some holes in that segment to let your trusted computers talk to that printer or get an image from that camera. Interesting. But, yeah. But you want to limit to just what so you the want. The same way we IO. do it like our guest Wi-Fi or public Wi-Fi. Yeah. IoT internet, should be it, a guest network uh, all its own. Exactly right. Devin. Fascinating. It, that's, that's our current advice for IoT anyway. I, I could keep talking about this. We're out of time. Let's get in at least one more prediction for 2023, Corey, before we, uh, uh, before we open it up for questions. So instead of business, I guess I will go a, a little crazy. This is the one that may not come true in that that might be five years from now, not next year. But we will say a robo taxi hack is going to result in a dazed and confused AR, AI car disrupting traffic. So I think all of us know <laughs> that 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 we're we're making automated self-driving cars. But what's more interesting is well, a lot you know, of because cities, the people who buy them don't shut up about them. That's exactly. For all but now of my it's Tesla not just people <laughs> buying them. If if you are in San Francisco and you hail a Waymo <laughs> or a Cruise at 10 p.m., yes, yes, you might have a robo taxi, a total humanless taxi, come up to you, and they they have them. Uh, Baidu is making them in Beijing. There's actually been over a million rides across cities around the world in robo taxis. Corey, course, this is already people. disrupting traffic. This is already happening. We're, we're seeing <laughs> these things crash into things. And uh, we like, I, I don't know. How, how, how right, so you're saying we're behind the game. I think well, we so. Were, I think this is already we, happening. We were, we were considering know, going to human harm or death, which, by the way, also okay. happened. 
in our prediction yes. where we talk about this, there has been an accident from a robo taxi running into a human driven car and a couple of passengers in both cars were injured. Oh, so nice. it could happen for sure. Uh, we are kind of predicting it will be a internet, like a, a, a connection attack. based attack. But some of the past attacks we've seen happen is remember, these are just using cameras and sensors and machine learning to figure out how to drive. There's been cases where you can use rock salt. It gets kind of cold in Canada during this season. You can use the, the rock salt to create fake lines, you know, road lines, where they've gotten cars to drive off roads because they're following the rock salt divider instead of the real one. And then oh you can kind of draw, draw a goodness. circle around it where it kind of gets stuck in the middle of nothing because it can't find its way out. So we we you're right that some of this has happened we always base our prediction i was on having a good support. conversation feeling yeah, good yeah. till now no, this is <laughs> that's a rock salt this is kind of low-tech stuff Corey. that can confuse it's, some of the greatest ai we've ever created wow yeah ai will get better but yeah right now it's pretty it's surprising you don't even have to use adversarial machine learning to defeat it Although, wait till we get into the machine learning going against machine learning. Soon it will be the bots battling each well, isn't other. Isn't that how the world ends? Hackers. Isn't that isn't that what every science fiction show? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Can we not do that, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, that's why we do the predictions because our goal is let's do the defense now, and then we will uh, uh, avert dystopian results. All right. Um, if if you if you were to see. Um, just maybe to close it out and invite anybody who has any questions to go ahead and, and throw them up now on cybersecurity or some of the technology things we're talking about. Um, there's predictions, but then there's just trends that are accelerating. Maybe not new, maybe not headline grabbing. What trends um, do either of you gentlemen see in the cybersecurity landscape? Maybe you're seeing some that are going down or some that are going up. Just curious, but writ large when it comes to business cybersecurity, what, what are the trend lines pointing at? Are we, are we, let me put it this way. Are we, for example, are we cresting finally the um, ransomware peak? I know the FBI, you know, caught some of the bad guys, including one in, uh, that was in Gatineau, Quebec, was responsible for so. It's like, are, are, are we nearing the end or is, where are we at kind of in your opinions on all this? I don't know if Calvin, I, I would say you're, you're right in that it, we might be plateauing on ransomware. It is still ransomware is a big trend that I still talk about, but it's the last thing I talk about now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it has become the most common payload if you want to quickly monetize. But I feel like the volumetric ransomware, meaning sending it to everybody and your brother and, and, and just hoping that 1% hit and that gives you high numbers, that's not succeeding very much for threat actors. Basic ransomware protection is blocking that kind of thing. What we see remaining in ransomware, in my opinion, is more the big game variety, where a much more sophisticated attacker will do traditional targeted attacks to get into your company. They, they then stay in your company for weeks, staging the ransomware. They don't just, it's not just one machine gets popped and tries to spread on its own. They breach yeah. your network, do lateral movement, stage the ransomware everything, and synchronize turning it all in at once. So it's a much bigger, sophisticated gotcha. effort uh, at targeted at certain types of companies. The unfortunate side effect is ransomwares aren't $300. Ransoms no. aren't $300 anymore. They're like $15 million when they do hit these big game companies. So yeah. it's still there, but I do think we're, our, our defense has made it harder for them. Yeah, I encourage everybody to Google about the gentleman in Gatineau, Quebec. He actually talked about how they monetize it. They would study the annual revenues of an organization, and their ransom was a sliding scale. These guys weren't kidding around. It's amazing. I mean, this guy was sitting on $3 billion in Gatineau. He, he used to be a government yeah, yeah. worker. Anyway. It, it's the wallet they captured. And yeah. 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 So, and by the way, they, they know we have backups now, too. So really, double extortion is the bigger thing, where they now have underground websites that are public to journalists. So not only are they smart in targeting the company, oh. they leak documents and they put it on a public yeah. website and they say, hey, journalists, look, we hacked so-and-so and they have two weeks if they are or a week. And if they don't pay us 15 million, we're going to... I don't care if they can restore it. We're going to leak all their customer data. That's the one thing I would say is is we're seeing on the rise is um, is that double extortion, the exfiltration of data. Um, 
And because the reality is, is like, yeah, maybe, maybe I can recover. Maybe I can block the ransomware, but now the data is gone. And do you want that publicly available? And what is the ramifications on, um, you know, regulators or having that information out on the public market? And so, um, that, that is up like quarter over quarter. It is, it is like, it is moving because most companies just don't have the uh, data loss prevention in place to even know if that data is moving out of the organization. And when we went to this, this cloud-based world where we, we collaborate and uh, anyone can share anyone, anything now with like the you know, likes of Google, the likes of Microsoft and, and leveraging these great By collaboration dance. tools but then you don't know where your data is and where who's it being shared with. And so we've enabled it through collaboration, but it's being used against many organizations as a result. And so here we are. So uh, we got, we have a question came in and it kind of plays well to what we were just talking about. And, and that's, what's the number one threat vector right now? May I make a guess? Is it still email or is it, or is, is it moved? Yes. Okay, you okay. Th that that's my for sure answer. I was going to offer you if you asked Devin, do you want me for for trends that are happening? Do you want the boring but real one, or sure, do you want the please. technically nerdy one? This is I, I call oh. this boring just because yeah. everyone knows this threat, but it's important because it is absolutely the number one threat vector: business email compromise. I say boring because even when I started in security 23 plus years ago, it was just dumb emails with attachments. And we're still dealing with, uh, yes, the emails are better. They also have links and social engineering phishing too. But over 90% of cyber attacks and malware infections start with malicious emails. And that's a combined 90%, that, you said. Yeah, wow. it's based on Verizon data breach data and trend micro data of yep. malware. I think it's something like 96% of malware starts with a malicious email. And Verizon breach has something like a 92 or 3% of, of targeted attacks start with email. And the way I put this in perspective is I, I know this is U.S. based. I'm sure your authorities have similar things. But here in the U.S., we have FBI run something called IC3, which is, I believe, Internet Consumer Crime Complaints, whatever. It's the it's really the only place where business can report cyber crime to the, the federal U.S. government. And OK. I like to compare it against ransomware because ransomware is making all the headlines. We talk about it so much. But according to FBI statistics for 2021, they, they've released their 2022 report. It is the latest, but it's for 2021. And 49.2 million in losses for ransomware. That's bad. But business email compromise accounts for 2.4 billion in losses way, way, way more than ransomware. And according to them, business email compromise accounts for 35% of cyber attack losses, which is the number one by far. So it, as much as you know about email security, watching out for links, phishing, things like that, it really is the biggest vector. So you should definitely handle email first. So, I, and I want to just do a public announcement, a PBA on this. Uh, all of you CFOs, CEOs, et cetera, who are listening, who decide that you don't need to do the cybersecurity awareness training and it's just for your employees, you are the target. You are, we see it so often. Please, please, they're after you and these are not dummies. They know how to study you and craft a clever email. Spear yeah. phishing has gotten crazy. They're, they're pretty smart. Last year, you mentioned spear smishing. So SMS, uh, it, how did, what did you think of that? That was an interesting term. Yeah, yeah. So uh, smishing is just base. It, it's text-based phishing. I'm sure every one of us has a cell phone. SMS is just a fancy acronym for text messages. And we've all started to receive weird bit lie links from random people on our phones. That's smishing. Part of our prediction for last year was smishing would extend to messenger-like apps. So it's already an issue on phones. Uh -huh. But think of all the other apps that are basically texting apps, but they're they're graphical and social media based. WhatsApp, Slack, Discord, Teams Chat, Facebook yeah. Messenger. They all just look like text apps, but they're a little more than text because they tend to have a picture and a profile associated with the uh, business. So we've seen a big increase in Messenger-based smishing-like phishing. So going to WhatsApp, you might get an email from Corey Nockreiner, 
unfortunately, I'm easy to find on the internet, so pretty easy to get my picture. Not many people will have this mustache picture, though. That's kind of new. <laughs> that's but new, yeah. you, you could create a profile <laughs> for me. You can send it to one of my employees on WhatsApp, which is something that's used a lot in Europe to communicate with uh, each other at a company. Yeah. And pow, it's an easy way to fish someone. So, well, and right now, at least the last while, email stuff. Yeah. yeah, you could be certified on Twitter as whomever you wanted for the last little while. They didn't go so well if anybody's been yeah. following. <laughs> for eight bucks, I can be an Elon Musk. I can create a similarly named parody account and get that blue check for eight bucks a month. So where Thank I you start? for democratizing Twitter for attackers, Musk. Smart, <laughs> smart decision there. You're I would do well, yeah, I'm sure. I won't count them out, but it's it's a rocky start, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Calvin, um, what scares you? This is a question I'm modifying that came in. Like, what what scares you in 2023? What's keeping you up at night as you think about your responsibilities of cybersecurity? Oh goodness. There's many things that scare me. If, if I were to like pick the scariest thing, um, I would say, I would say uh, an insider attack. And because, and the reason why I say that is I, I, we have a lot of things that we do to ensure that we're, you know, we're secure on the perimeter, we're, we're secure on the, uh, you know, internal, um, we have technology and everything like that. But if you had a, a person infiltrate your business, that you know you went through all the the regular checks, you security, background checks, background checks yeah, the, yeah. the whole deal, and they, you know, they were swayed, and we see this happening. We oh, see they were them... paid or or somehow influenced externally. Yeah, correct. And uh, and you know we have you know we have triggers in our system that absolutely watch for you know type, type behavior that we would say shouldn't be happening but if they were just under the radar enough um that would be a that'd be a scary scenario and so we always are thinking around you know what what can we do to uh, restrict access control it um, limit it silo it so that way um the overall blast area of said inside attacker is really really limited and um, it, it is one of the th things that absolutely keep me up at night and things that we're always looking to uh, address within within the business. The so. worst scenarios I've had to navigate with customers aren't the ransomware, which has been awful, or even the funds transfer frauds, which have been awful. It's the former employee and everything they did on the way out. Like, those are ugly and they're legal. And uh, you, you kind of hit close to I've, I've, the feels there, Calvin, of some incidents I've helped uh, clients with. Corey, of your 2023 prediction, which one scares you the most if it were to come through true? What, what, oh, what's uh, predictions? Yeah. Uh, let me. Uh, okay, I guess one is since we'll talk about human death, by the way, I really like Calvin's. And I would say that he, remember, cybersecurity has a human part, not just the technology. So I'm more scared about the gaps in the human part than the gaps in technology. But if I'm re relegated to my predictions, we do have ones that we believe will result in deaths. And it's consumer drones used in kinetic warfare will result in unintentional harm or death. Uh, you know, scrappy countries like the Ukraine are buying off the shelf drones made in China to do some pretty cool things. Throw a grenade on it and they can. Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, one, they can just get uh, sky level intelligence of battlefields yeah. very quickly and easily. But yes, they specifically have put grenades on them. And that would be an intentional use of the drone. But these are consumer drones, you know, military office. Obviously, I'm concerned about military drones and robotics because they will be dangerous, but they're going to be not bulletproof, but they're going to be protected from adversaries. Consumer drones have been hackable. They've had vulnerabilities even in the, the oh, brand you see most yeah. popular. So our worry is that consumer drones, even if you consider it the good side using it, they might be maliciously taken over by the other side and that that harm you were trying to do could be turned back on you. So that's kind of the gist of one of the predictions. And it, it's really the can, you know, it, it is smart and scrappy to use consumer technology and if, if it's your only choice. Uh, but we also think the fact that consumer technology is being used in this unintended way is going to have consequences. 
Well, gentlemen, we have reached the top of the hour. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for your questions and for participating in this conversation. I was, it was really educational, a lot of fun, I would say, uh, Calvin and Corey. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Corey, we'll all be looking forward to uh, looking at your predictions on 2023 on the WatchGuard website. And as I mentioned, we're going to be continuing our cybersecurity conversations with uh, uh, an insurance lens at our next webcast. Take care, everyone, and so long. Cheers. Cheers.